Good morning and welcome to the forum. My name is Malcolm Clemens Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral. It's a blessing to have you all here on, on pretty much the first spring day of the year. It's just magnificent, the first Sunday when we really are, are seeing the sun. As many of you know, Grace Cathedral chooses a theme for in, its inspiration every year. And in 2019, our theme is the body. Um, we also um, have recently come up with a new vision and mission statement. Our vision statement is, um, is a spiritually alive world. Our mission statement is reimagining church with courage, joy, and wonder. And I m mention that today because there's no one I can think of who writes about the body with more courage, joy, and wonder than Mary Roach, who's our guest for today. Um, she's the author of six New York Times bestsellers about the science of death, the afterlife, sex, digestion, space flight, and most recently, the military. And they're all available in the back afterwards for sale. And I do encourage you to read them. I, um, you know, I read a lot of books every year, but um, these are, are really special. Um, we've been waiting for them for a long time. Please join me in welcoming Mary Roach. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's really true. A lot of the things that you're writing about, no one wrote about before, and I wonder why that is. Yeah, well, starting with Stiff, uh, and part of the reason I wrote this book about cadavers was that uh, I'd never written a book before. I'd written magazine pieces for 10 years, and I thought, well, what, could I, what hasn't been written about? And it was basically like if it, either cadavers or like squirrels. I mean, there was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. there was nothing. I felt like there was nothing left that hadn't been written about. Uh, so I thought, cadavers, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> sign uh, me up. Sign me up. Uh, and um, it was a strange experience in that people would say, oh, it's exciting. You're, you're writing a book now. That's great. Um, what's it about? And I'd, I'd say, dead bodies. <laughs> and it's kind of a funny book. And then people would sort of make excuses to get away from me. <laughs> it's kind of the end of the conversation. Right yeah, there. Exactly, exactly. But I, I, I do, I, I mean, as I was preparing for today, I, I, I do think there's just, there are a lot of things. I mean, for instance, in, in the book about space flight, um, uh, uh, packing for mm -hmm. Mars. Yeah. I mean, uh, there. I mean, I remember learning so many of the peripheral things that you mentioned. You know, about the size of the rockets and you know right. the animals that went up and yeah. the space race. I mean, I went, as a boy, I was so engaged in that. Yeah. But I, I never heard anybody talk about farting in space or <laughs> urinating in space yeah, or defecating yeah. in space or any having sex right. in space. Right. And um, so all the things that were kind of at the periphery that I never thought about all yeah. of a sudden were at the center. Yeah. So so why? Why yeah. never, did I never hear about those things? I think I think that um, because you were hearing a, a <clears throat> about it a lot through NASA and, yeah. and and the space race was it was a very exciting thing just unto itself. We are going to be the first. We are you know rushing against the you know the yes, the Soviets. We are we are trying to get there first. So it was all caught up in the heroics and and also I think having grown up uh, uh, a child of the uh, Gemini and the Apollo era, I. I you would see them in these suits, yes. and they almost didn't seem like bodies. They seemed beyond that, larger than life, these big kind of lumbering things. And you, you'd forget there's like squishy human body in there, yeah. and we're putting it up in a spa in, into a place that has no gravity, no air, that's ungodly cold, That we and, and what will happen? And so um, what I got fascinated by was the very early, even before Gemini, just just sending up, you know, monkeys in in a in in, in, in like a, a simulated gravity flight to see like, c can you even survive yeah. without gravity? What will will the body burst? Like, can people swallow without gravity? Can they start to pee without gravity? And nobody knew. So early on, there were these. These, you know, volunteers would go up and they'd, they'd, they'd fly the plane in that, that <coughs> sort of roller coaster pattern and you'd have a few seconds of weightlessness and then they'd have to try to pee and try to swallow yeah. and all, and that kind of, uh, and, and there was a lot of kind of hand wringing going on and people like, ooh, I hope it's okay. Uh, and it turned out it was okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's part of what I love about your writing too, is that there are just a lot of things that are kind of settled issues that you kind of forget that, um, yeah. you, you know, people are imagining the most dangerous possible thing. And so it's yeah. almost like they were worrying about the wrong kinds of things. Yeah, right, right. I mean, there was the very real uh, fear that, you know, you were sent, you're basically strapping somebody to an, uh, a big bomb <laughs> yeah, and hoping yeah. it goes well. So there was a lot to worry about without worrying about um, things that later <clears throat> came 
to be realized to be a problem like bone loss and, and, and muscle right. degradation because you're, you're not using your skeleton or your muscles when you're in zero gravity. So your body kind of says, oh, I guess we don't need those. Let's just take them apart and use, use that for something else. else. Yeah. yeah. So um, it gradually uh, became clear there were, uh, there were other problems, but initially you, you, it was just all about survival and getting there first and getting there alive. Yeah. Yeah, I have so many more questions about NASA. I mean, I, 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 we had some, we used to be in Mountain View. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we had all the NASA scientists there. Yeah. And I remember Oop. that um, the, um, one of our, the kids, our, um, elementary school, um, yeah. other parents, um, basically said just uh, space travel is just not, it's so not good for human beings that yes. we just shouldn't do it. Y yeah, yeah. We, uh, that's a, that we just shouldn't do it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she just, I mean, and you know, how wow, yeah. sometimes people in that mode are just, you just send up probes and, and you know, yes. robots and that kind of thing. That is an, well, that's an argument that, that can be made that we can do this with, with probes and with robots. And, and, and I spoke to people uh, at NASA about that, and, and they, they said, yeah, that's true, but if you send probes up and you, uh, if, you, if you're trying to learn, like, what is the geology of the moon, you could try to do that with probes. It would take a very long time. And, and if you sent up a geologist in like two minutes of looking around oh, yeah. and looking at what's there, a geologist can just, based on all of his or her knowledge, know very quickly. Yeah. So there is an argument to be made for sending actual humans right, right. up. It is very expensive. And, and the money certainly, yeah, could be better spent here on Earth if you could apply it in the places, you know, you could say, if you, yeah. you, okay, you guarantee me it's going to be spent on education right, and health right, and, exactly. you know, scientific research and all the good things. Uh, if you could guarantee me that, then it's like, okay, maybe we'll take it away from the space program. But it never works that way. It just goes into the military budget anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or whatever it is. Or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. so many times when I'm reading the books that you write, I, I imagine you as a, as a, you and I being <coughs> in like fourth grade in class together. What yeah. were you like as a kid? I mean, you, yeah. you have that time where you described the torso, you know, in the, or, in the internal oh, organs. Oh, where you take all the organs yeah, out and put yeah, them back exactly. in. I was really good at that. <laughs> I bet you were. I would be, you get a stopwatch. I'd be your lab partner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, but I, I, you know, I was interested in science early on in a kind of a, like, interested in the process. I remember as a kid in, I think it was maybe fifth grade, my neighbor and I just out went out and we did what's called the potted meat experiments. My neighbors ate, uh, that would buy these like canned, like spam kind oh, wow, of right. bleh, potted. So we made these little sandwiches with potted I meat. I had spam we, yesterday. <laughs> you did not. I did. You had spam? My wife's Hawaiian. We had like, it was a big <laughs> Hawaiian breakfast. So we're so honored to have these delicious spam <laughs> recipes. So yeah. Wow. So, but anyway, That's so you and your friend ate the spam. I'd like to spam. just talk about spam for the rest of the... <laughs> we could. Maybe that'll be your next book. <laughs> spam. It sounds like a Mary Roach book, spam. It does. Um, <laughs> so, so you and your friend but, were okay. So yeah, we made these, these little uh, we call it we call it the potted meat experiments, and we hung one from a tree, and we put one in the oh, snow and yeah. looked for tracks. We didn't have a theory. We didn't really had, know what we were investigating, but we were just sort of playing at science and being outdoors, which is part of for me what was is appealing about science is the is the locations. It's like you're out oh, in the yeah. field and you're in these just, you know, whatever you're studying, it takes you into this uh, kind of um, exotic place. So I had an interest for um, the process of science and the, the field work, but I, um, I, you know, got to advanced algebra and that was <laughs> kind of it for, for Matt, you know, I wasn't gonna be go, uh, going to medical school probably. Or so, um, but, yeah, but you know what's too bad is I didn't, I had a biology teacher who somehow made biology not fascinating I totally and I not. don't know how you do that yeah. now because yeah. that's what that's what I write about a lot uh, right, is biology right. and physiology and um, I don't know how you 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 make that boring or uh, maybe it was me maybe I was distracted in high school by other things but I I, I feel like if that like high school teachers and middle school teachers are, are so important just to, in in sparking curiosity about the world and about whether it's science or politics or, or whatever, but just to, to light that fire, because uh, it wasn't lit for me. Uh, yeah, I know and exactly what you mean. I mean, another part is, I, I mean, I guess it's, it's like regarding our bodies as something other. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Or, or, or I mean, I, I, there's a kind of squeamishness that I, that I, I yeah. think about our own bodies that yes. I think can, can be really harmful for us. I, I, I think so too. I think when you think of yourself, you think of yourself as a, um, 
a personality, a spirit. Uh, you don't, it's like the packaging, you kind of yeah. try to ignore. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, you don't really, well, like I, I remember for Gulp, when I, I got my first colonoscopy, uh, and I said, I don't want the drugs because I want to see my, the inside of my own colon. Right, and, exactly. the, and, and the doctor's like, are you nuts? You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can do that, and as it turns out, it is a little painful. But but I had uh, this desire. I mean, to, like to see the inside of your body. You go through your whole life with this amazing machine, right. and you never see most of it. And I, maybe I'm strange, but I, I was like, what is in there? And I and I also just from writing these books, I have a tremendous amount of respect for just the intricacies and amazing. Um, relationships of all these parts and pieces yeah. that do this work for us completely out of our consciousness for the most part. It's really miraculous. And yeah, it almost yeah. feels like, a, for me, that was like a religious experience. I mean, that experience of awe and wonder. Yes. And, and maybe you do, uh, yeah. Emmanuel Kant did it when he was looking at the sky and, and, and you yeah. did it when you, when you saw the inside of your, of your, of it, your own body. Yeah, there's a, the same, I, I described it as similar to when I, I saw the Northern Lights right, for, the, right. for just this sense of almost, yeah, awe, awe, awe and wonder. Uh, just there it is. It's like you know, and, and your own skeleton. You never. It's kind of creepy to think about, but at the same time, you know, it's like this. You have a skeleton in you. Right, right. And you never and see it. And it's it, bearing, I mean, it's yeah. unique. I mean, it's got the broken finger from the you know the, yeah, exactly. the football game in your tenth grade year, and it's got you know it's, yeah. it's it, the way you can walk. Your posture is is yeah yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you yeah sometimes I like I'll be going like wow there's this weird divot right here. I wonder what that looks like. <laughs> like I wish I could see my skeleton. You know, uh, I mean an X-ray you can, but just to be able to to I don't know. I had a, I had a fantasy when I was working on not fantasy that is weird. But um, I had imagined. imagined when I was working on <laughs> Stiff that it would be oh, yeah. interesting to uh, donate your body to become a classroom skeleton and to oh, kind yeah, of live right. on as a right. uh, this interesting object in a classroom. And then I learned about the technique of getting the bones out of the body. And I'm like, eh, maybe not. <laughs> uh, but but uh, it did it did kind of appeal to me just because it is this you know kind of beautiful not messy or stinky, just right. beautiful um, bone structure. And, and you walk around with it every day and you never get to meet it. But, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. I, I, I like the, I mean, the colonoscopy is a great example. Um, the, the, you know, the sex research is another example. But I mean, yeah. you've been um, kind of, you've been an experimental subject in, in so many different things. And, yeah. and what have you learned, just, not just about the subject that was intended to be, but just yes. in your life as an experimental subject? Some people probably are experimental subjects in just kind of a narrow band of things, but it seems like you probably have had more different <laughs> experiences. Well, I had, I, I had a few of them in... Um, in Bonk, which was the about right, right, um, sexual right. physiology and and, the, and bringing bringing the study of sex uh, sexual physiology into the laboratory uh, and, and actually making it the focus of research and study, which wasn't done until like around 1900. I know it's amazing. No, no one be, be, for the very reasons that you're you're saying because it was it, you know it's an awkward thing to bring people into a laboratory setting, wire them up, and say. Okay, now masturbate, and we've got you all wired up. Like, right. Who wants to sign up for that? That's yeah, really awkward. Exactly. And uh, and it was awkward. Can as I do a the heart study <laughs> instead? Yeah, right. <laughs> I was like uh, that uh, plantar fasciitis yeah, study. Sign me up. I'll, I'll do, do that. that one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but that and it, it was. Uh, but part of what I wanted to understand with that book in particular was was that very awkward experience of being a subject. So for, for that one, I, I had a couple of uh, instances where I, I was a subject, partly because uh, it's hard enough for these researchers to, to get oh, yeah. people to, to do the study um, and then to then have someone with a notepad and a tape recorder in the room. Um, right, if you're the we, person we, who's being experimented on. Yes, it, it's right. It's one thing to have, be, have you there for the plantar fasciitis study, but for the sex exactly. study is just... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and I did find, and, and, and the thing with, with sex, with sexual physiology, um, if you're studying arousal or orgasm or whatever your, your subject is, you don't really uh, need a couple. Masters and Johnson actually brought couples in, yeah. uh, which, which doesn't happen very much anymore. And I wanted to kind of get at that very unique awkwardness. So I found one study uh, that was going on in London. It was a, an imaging study, and they actually were right. going to have two people. 
Uh, and I said, I'd, would you mind if I'm there in the lab when this goes on? Uh, and Dr. Deng said, uh, um, well, we, we on could one do condition. that. <laughs> uh, we could do that, but we're, I'm having trouble f uh, finding subjects for this study. So, you know, if, if your organization can provide uh, a couple, I'll be willing to do it. So my organization called its husband. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, my husband is a very, um, he's a very, he's a good sport. He is a good sport. He's a good sport. sport. <laughs> yes, he is. He's here in the back row. Uh, a round of applause for Ed. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, it, it is a uniquely uh, awkward thing. Uh, well, and, and I mean, and, it, but, but, and but important. And, so and, important. And, yes. And it was so interesting to me that Nasters and Johnson in particular, I mean, Kinsey did some of this work in the 40s. Um, t did it in his attic, not in a laboratory setting, tended to be his staff um, and, and not people from the outside yeah. uh, community. But Masters and Johnson brought in people from the university and right. they f I don't know how they got enough people to do it. This uh, was, you know, late 50s and 60s and, and, and yet they did it. And pretty heroic thing. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, you know, one of, I, I loved Bonk and it was super helpful. I mean, because, you know, there's things in, in all yeah. the books that are helpful in different ways. But, yeah. you know, I, I, I thought that was really helpful to me just to understand. So things I yeah. just haven't thought very much about. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one of the things that really struck me too was just, you know, if you have male researchers doing everything, yeah. then then you're going to have a, a different outcome than having yes. women. And, I, and I, yeah. I, I almost wonder if, you know, what, what has been your experience just in terms of having women entering into these research fields and just how it's changed our perspective on, on, on things like, you know, sex research or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I have, n not because I've had any kind of a quota or any, uh, but, I, but in most of my books, as it's turned out, there's been a lot of, the, a lot of the researchers have been women and um, I am always glad for that. I mean, I, uh, I, and there is a different, like in Packing for Mars, there's a woman at um, NASA Ames named April Ronka and she was studying, uh, she had rats that were <coughs> um, pregnant rats going, uh, uh, going up or, uh, and being in the space shuttle for two weeks and um, the actual birth happened, the, the rats gave birth um, on Earth just because the rig that you'd have to set up right. for a I rat remember. to give birth and the pups to not float away, you know, was a, you yeah. wouldn't really think about all of that, but a zero gravity birth is quite a, an undertaking. Uh, so anyway, but she was interested in, in um, the development uh, of the fetus and also you know, the birth, uh, what would happen. Um, I was amazed that, that there, was, there was so little work on conception and embryology and um, birth that, that there has been until her very little attention paid because the whole goal of NASA, or that their stated right. goal is like one day we will populate other, we, we will set up a, yeah. perhaps a base on Mars or, or, or we, will, we will be in space. You know, way, way, the long term yeah. goal. And, and at a certain point, that's really important to know. Can conception even happen in zero gravity? Does it affect the fetus? Is there, is there are there things we need to know? And she's like, she was, her, she was like, it's kind of amazing that yeah. I'm the only person studying that. Right. You know, just I mean, not that not that women would be the only ones interested in that, but um, but it, uh, it, it, you just don't. I, I think that's so interesting, yeah. and, it, and it's something that you can describe the question so yeah. easily, yeah. and yet to have one person in the world be working on that. Is yeah, yeah. There was. I mean, I think there was someone who uh, there was a a guy who put some bull semen up there. <laughs> there right. was some semen work that was done. So there was a little bit of, um, I think they were looking at sperm motility and whether right, there right. was a, any part. sort of um, effect on that. But other than that, there was really very little uh, in, in what you would think of as a very basic uh, piece of information right, that you would right. want to know. Completely. Um, it's similar to you know the, the study of um, sexual physiology, which you know we were talking right. earlier, just um, had been, had been People come at it from you know behind or from the side of like fertility and conception problems and what's going on, but nobody really uh, studied sexuality or s sex as you know the the pleasure of sex right, or, right. or the physiology of it. It just hadn't been. There'd be textbooks in the '60s, biology textbooks, where there would just be nothing. There'd be no reference to you know clitoris, right, orgasm. Right. Nope. That's what I don't know what that is. Exactly. <laughs> 
Not important. Not important. <laughs> We're not talking uh, yeah, about that. Right. But yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, uh, that taboo is something is just like that is wrapped up in this. Yeah. And, and there is something about um, sex, especially, I mean, there's like this symbolic, like imaginative, there's this, there's a part of ourself that yeah. that's not very easy to study that, you know, that yes. those mental images and what arousal is. And, yeah. And so, so it, it does, um, you know, yeah. take it yeah. seriously and we're going to really study. Yeah. And, and I think because there, be, there are, you know, it, it's an essential part of, of happiness and re healthy relationships. Uh, and so it, it, it's important to be able to, to have people be able to go to somebody for help or to explain things. Yeah. And, you know, the, this one, the, 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 the earliest sex researcher was a, the, uh, who really um, came at it just in sex for sex sake, not fertility. Uh, Robert Latou Dickinson uh, was an obstetrician and gynecologist around the um, turn of the last century. And, and he uh, got interested in it because he had patients coming to him who couldn't, who couldn't conceive. And he'd say, well, what are you doing together? And uh, it would turn out that the man thought he was inside the woman, right, but he right, exactly. was just at the doorway right, and right. Um, didn't know. Or, you know, and he would just say, he just was a, a man who has a, a gift for frankness. And he'd yeah. say, you know, like, okay, darling, you're, okay, you're going to have to spread your legs, first of all. You know, just right. like, ba just basics that people uh, didn't know. And, and, and you know, so, so much human misery that comes from um, misunderstanding and yeah. miscommunication and so uh, I really feel like those those folks, Masters and Johnson, and and their some of their predecessors, and they were it was very it was heroic what yeah. they did to just um, be open about it and to to put it in the the realm of science. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's one of the things I appreciate inquiry. so much about yeah. that too. Is just I mean the scientists are paying a price for this. In other words, there are sex researchers that we never heard of because they yeah. weren't granted tenure, or they could never get a job, or yeah, they, yeah. you know they they had um, ideas yeah. about how to do. In 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 2019, you know they yes. would be at the center of their field, and in 1952 they're they're ostracized. And, yes, yes, and yeah, they're exactly. Um, Masters and Johnson had to hire a second secretary to answer all the hate mail yeah, when wow. human sexual response came out. Yeah. There was a, a tremendous, uh, and Kinsey as well, when his, his books came out, just a tremendous ba backlash, uh, just, just, a, just, I think, born of discomfort. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. and, I mean, but And now, uh, you know, the pendulum has kind of swung, swung back in a way in that there are, there are groups that would, that go through and look at um, government-funded studies and highlight anything that's about sex oh, and know. say, you know, that this shouldn't be, you know, government t taxpayer dollars shouldn't be right. going towards any of this. So researchers are, are you know, they'll, they won't use the word sex, sexual, you know, they'll, they'll kind of Have cloak to, it in. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about that. That words, was one yeah. of like the questions I usually ask, I wanted to ask later on. Yeah. But, you know, the the um, the current presidential administration. There have been a lot yes. of um, journalists who've been writing about uh, kind of an anti-scientific bias, perhaps. Yes. That um, that that makes some basic research hard to do and interrupts the mm -hmm. continuity of research projects that have been going on for a long time. Yes. And I wondered if right. you have any special insight for us about that or um, anything that you might know about. Um, um, it's. Uh, you know, I just it was just interesting to me to see how they were having to go around it by having to sort of disguise using the title of a of a study, disguise what in fact they were studying. Yeah. Um, well, that's so interesting because I, I mean we were always thinking about, about you know ecology, the environment, cl climate change. Yes. You were talking about yeah how we under, understand our bodies is affected by that too. Yeah, 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 and uh, and I think that there's also a tendency to take something um, you can you can take a study out of context. And it will it will seem, you know, yeah. trivial or silly or or um, duh, right. funny. Yeah, yeah, but it's but but once you understand why it's how it fits into the broader uh, context and and progression of research, it does make sense. I mean, research isn't you know we're not scientific research so much of the time isn't about getting answers, it's about getting better questions. Mm. So it's a long parade of, of kind of narrowing the focus and, and moving toward the answer or realizing the answer lies in a different direction. And, and if you just pull out some piece of it that seems trivial or goofy, then, then you know, you're interrupting that flow. And you don't, right. you know, it's anytime politics gets mix, messed up, 
with science, uh, uh, it, it tends to be very frustrating for the scientists. Oh yeah, definitely. Even just NASA, you know, every time there's a new administration, the administrate, like, you know, I was, I was working on packing for Mars uh, when um, the Obama was first elected, and um, there's always a shift in priorities. We had been working on a, um, we, NASA, <laughs> had been, <laughs> <That's us. laughs> I've been working on, yeah, I've been working on that moon base. Uh, <laughs> the, there was a, there, there uh, had been this tremendous amount of work. Uh, we were going to build a base on the moon. It was the Constellation program. They were working on um, crew capsules that they were going to, wow. you know, that would ferry the astronauts there. Habitats. It was very cool. There were, you know, I looked at some of the model habitats and so much work had gone into this. And then, as always happens, not, not singling Obama out right. in any way, uh, just the priorities changed. And that was the end. We're not going to the moon anymore. And all that work and all that money right. uh, and all that expertise, uh, what was I mean, some of it could be recycled. Some of it, yeah. you know, some of it uh, is useful knowledge that you could apply elsewhere, but so frustrating for those so people. So frustrating. Fr yeah, I can yeah. imagine you've dedicated your, you've, you know, 40 hours a week you've, yeah. you know, for 18 yeah. years, and all of a sudden, you know, we're not yes. going to do that now. And you think, well, gosh, maybe they'll rediscover my research 20 years in the future. But yeah, yeah it must be so demoralizing. It, yeah, it, it's Especially really... Especially to have that idealism that you're... Yeah, yeah, and the and, and again, that the reasons are, are political, that, that yeah, somebody's yeah. just decided that, that you know, that's not important, this is important, but without really know, knowing very much about it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of why, you know, whenever I am moving into a new organization, trying to err on the conservative side, I mean, if there, yeah. people are doing something in a certain way, right. you assume there's a reason for that way, that, that, yes. that they just, they're not just completely unreasonable people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the, my favorite things about your writing is I, I, I sometimes I really like little smiley faces in the margins for <laughs> things that made me laugh out yeah. loud. And I have a lot of smiley faces faces in the margins <laughs> of your books and I wonder if you have like a kind of like a philosophy of what makes things humorous or funny or you just yeah. kind of like just you just don't think about it just you know well you can't stop yourself you know, <laughs> you know actually what it is is um I'm I'm a lot of the humor comes from what I the the, the research material that I gather I am drawn to things that I know will be funny or fun or surprising to write up so, so um, if, I, if I didn't do that, if somebody handed me a pile, here's, here's what you have to write a book out of. We've done all the research oh, right. for you. I'd, I, I pr it probably wouldn't be a very funny book because <laughs> I'm very much looking for the, for the material. From the very beginning. Yeah, from the very beginning, including the topic of the book. Yeah. I know that there's going to be some wonderful awkwardness in the study of sexual physiology. Right, You're exactly. bringing it into a lab. You've got people in white coats with clipboards and other people like... <laughs> yeah, being yeah, because you were there. there. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Like, what was that like? I mean, what? what uh, let's bring Ed up. <laughs> <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> no, it was. Um, uh, yeah, very, very, uh, very um, not very sexy. Yeah, yeah, um, completely. Not very sexy. This and, doesn't and seem fun to me, honey. <laughs> no. And Ed said to the Ed said to the researcher, just joking. He says, like, where's the candlelight and soft music <laughs> and the researcher who, who really did he wasn't a facetious kind of fellow yeah. and he, he took it seriously oh, and he great. said um oh i'm, I'm sorry because we're in a hospital with mm -hmm. fluorescent overhead lights and he said I went, uh wait on my laptop i have the soundtrack to les mis <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great uh anyway so how, how do we get back to that? I don't I know. I know, I know. Yeah, but I, I like that. So it's already built in. For, I think part of it's your yes, voice, it's too. Built, yeah. It's like your projected personality. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, so, right. I, mean, I, so yep. I mean, I don't know how you arrived at that. Maybe you can describe that, too. I mean, it's you, always, you know, I look back at the first pieces I wrote when I, I first moved to San Francisco, and I wrote for Image Magazine, which a lot of you probably don't remember. But uh, I just was drawn to one of the first pieces I ever wrote. It was a short piece where I went out with the pothole patrol. Oh, yeah. Filling potholes one morning. And I just, the, the fact that they were the pothole patrol. But they had, they had all of this lingo to describe the potholes and the different right. kinds. There was a, something that I, I asked, I said, well, what is that? He, I forget his terminology. He said, well, that's like a dip. It's a sinking in. Uh, and just these, I don't yeah, know, just right. their language that they spoke and the, uh, just any opportunity to step into a different world really appealed to me. And um, I just assumed that the pothole patrol would be kind of 
a good amusing. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I guess that's always been um, yeah. what has struck me as as I mean, I'm, it's just me trying to have fun. Right, right, yeah. right. Completely. Yeah, trying to make my job fun. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, how, like writing, how did that come about? I mean, uh, writing came about because um, uh, 1981. When I graduated and I moved out to California, uh, was a recession, and I um, had a, I had a BA degree, so um, I didn't really have a lot of marketable job skills. And what you do learn as an undergraduate is how to throw a sentence together. And yeah. uh, I started out as a copy editor, uh, which you know most um, college graduates can do with very little training. I mean, you need get a copy of you know Chicago Manual right, style, right, exactly. words into type, kind of you know get yourself up to speed. And I did that and very quickly realized um, it's not a good career for me. I'm not meticulous, precise, exactly, precise you, you know, you have to be someone who cares so attentive to detail. deeply that yeah. um, this was capitalized differently in chapter 11 than in chapter two. Yeah. And my kind of take would was sort of like, ah, yeah. who's going to notice, right, right. <laughs> which is little not how you can think as a copy editor. Yeah. So I, you know, v had, had worked on enough manuscripts, um, book manuscripts, to, to have a sense of um, maybe it would be more fun to, to, to write the, the, write the right. stuff than to clean it up. Yeah, exactly. That's how I, it I happened. <laughs> it was that. kind of it. Yeah. You know, um, in Gulp, um, it, it is, that's about our, our bodies, part yeah. of our bodies that we use every day, the alimentary canal. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed that too. That was very helpful. But I wonder if you had to like boil it down, like what would be something helpful for us to know about our alimentary canal that might be like useful to us at some point in the future or interesting to us now? You know, um, yeah, people have often asked like, how did that book change me? Um, and there's a chapter, you know, before you get down in the real, just up in the head, yes, right. um, I was fascinated to fletcherizing. learn. Fletcherizing. Yeah, oh, fletcherizing is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fletcher, wow. We could talk about good, Fletcher. Yeah. But, um, Mr. Fletcher. Uh, but, but before even that, um, uh, you have you, you have two sets of nostrils, basically. You're yeah. smelling on the inhale, but, if, but when you exhale, if you have food or wine in your mouth, you're, you're, you're sending those volatiles, those vapors up, you know, into the smelling section again. So you're, uh, if you kind of exhale a little bit while you've got the wine in your mouth or the food, you, you, the flavors become very wow. uh, vivid. And, and uh, so I, that changed me in that I kind of, uh, I do that more. But you don't want to do it too vigorously because then you have, I think it's called nasal regurgitation where it comes out oh, yeah. your, <laughs> comes out your nose. Right. That's so like don't the do that eating too. spaghetti and laughing at yeah, the same time. Right, don't right. read Mary yeah, Rose and exactly. eat spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great one because actually I read that section yeah. and I, it, and I remember now, but and now I hear it. I'm going to try that out next and, time. And this is the, the concept that I, uh, that was new to me that I found fascinating was uh, this, there's something called stretch receptors, and uh, you have them in your colon and in your rectum, and they, they uh, communicate with the brain. Like, so if you have gas building up in your intestine and it's stretching out, it's, these receptors know that, and they, tr they let you know by pain, like right. gas pain. Yeah. And, and that's important because if you, you know, the gas built up to the point you would have a rupture of your intestine, your colon, and that could be fatal. So intestinal gas, like farting is a life-saving. Right, right, exactly, act. like that too, exactly. Um, uh, and you have them in the rectum, and that kind of tells you when you need to empty things. And, and so I was like, wow, stretch your stomach as well. Yeah. You know, if you had gas building up in the stomach really rapidly, you would be in danger of a rupture. Um, uh, you, you, you will burp, you will belch or vomit, you know, uh, that sort of, that will happen automatically. But a belch is, again, that's a life-saving thing. So you're letting the gas out so that you don't, you know, stretch it too much. So that discomfort for that you're feeling, that's, you know, the stretch receptors are sort of letting the brain know. So I, I was just very excited about that, you know, that that's a, yeah. who knew that they had these things and exactly. that's how it worked. And, and when you have a colonoscopy, the pain, you know, you could, if there's a polyp, they can just get rid of that, you know, they can sort of burn that off without 
anesthetic because right. you don't feel that kind of pain. But when they if go around the corner and they stretch out the cold, that's what hurts. Yeah, yeah. When they're stretching. It. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. too because there's all the subconscious parts too. It's in a way, it's like our body. We we, we may know something on a subconscious level, yeah. and our body says you need to know this on a conscious level. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I don't care what you're doing, but you need to address this right now. Yeah. 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 Um. I, I, Grunt was a, it was a you know book about the body and war. <clears throat> Yes. And I wonder if you can um, talk a little bit about what you learned is, is, is in doing that work. Because, um, you know, our understanding of war is yeah. constantly evolving. Well, Grunt, so, yeah, um, Grunt, is a, Grunt is a book kind of about the, uh, just the day-to-day -day difficulties. I mean, as a, as a human body, I mean, the, uh, you're being put into environments that, I mean, it, it's a, yeah, you've got extreme heat, you've got extreme stress, extreme sleep deprivation, often uh, cold, um, fear. So, so you're taking the human body and all, we, all of these things that we experience on a day-to-day -day level are, are experienced in the extreme uh, in, in combat. And the military has, so the military uh, has spent a lot of time trying to understand things like heat stroke and sleep deprivation. So they've, they, they, uh, in its extreme forms, and then you know it ends up being things that are interesting and useful to the rest right. of us. So that that was sort of how I mean it's it's a study of the human body in really extreme circumstances. Uh, so, um, but again, it's a, an excuse for me to kind of wow, like go on, how on a ballistic missile submarine and, and right, or right. or um, how and, and or the the tank where they train. Yeah, um, gosh. That I mean, the, yes. There's there's a escape trainer at the um, Naval Biomedical, I'm forgetting the acronym, research lab. But it's a, uh, you know, you can actually get at a, not, not way, way down at the Marianas Trench, but there's a, you know, a certain level at, at which you can actually escape from a submarine, but it, it's very tricky. And um, the sailors all practice that yeah. uh, at this big, it's this just vertical swimming pool, and they have to um, kind of you know, right, right, exactly, because every single part of your yeah, you body's gotta, pressure, yeah. Yeah, exactly, learn how to deal with the pressure. And anyway, so, so um, some of the facilities that they, um, the military has are pretty fascinating. And, yeah. I, I've thought about that too while, while you're writing, especially that section, like how do you, how do you <coughs> get invited to these places? Like how do you like, get invited to be on the Polaris submarine? Or yeah, the, well that yeah. one took over a year yeah, that, that yeah. to get onto the um, ballistic missile submarine because, uh, um, well, at that time, there were no women on them, it, so there weren't, wasn't a lot of options for where would I sleep. Yeah. Uh, so that was a little tough. Um, I had to go out, um, and I didn't want to go out for months, which those 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 are basically that's a, a a roving nuclear arsenal, and the whole idea is that it's out and it's hidden, and no one knows where it is, and they stay out for months, and I didn't want to go out for months, so I went out, uh, and it took a, a a lot of just. I'm very persistent. I wear people down to a stud. <laughs> <laughs> I just would call this, this one guy, Jerry Lamb, who happened to have read some of my books, and he was oh, like, that's great. I'd like to do this. I'm retiring soon. I don't give a shit what they say. Let's make this happen. <laughs> that's great. And he was um, very much my advocate, found a way to do it. Uh, it took about a year uh, before I was able to go out. But, uh, and we, we ended up doing it by, uh, there were some um, prospective commanding officers who had to take a practical exam oh, yeah. where they, we, they'd be out on the sub, and it was a great time to be out because they were doing... Um, simulations of things going very wrong, so it was fascinating. Yeah, you know, oh, and they definitely. were doing a simulated launch of all missiles, which, and I'd look around and I was like, would you be just blowing your nose if this was a real, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> right. I don't know, it's just getting people used to the routine of launching 17 nuclear missiles was very, it was just very strange. Yeah. It was so interesting and, and kind of unnerving. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it surprises me that we don't worry or talk more about it. I mean, it's just a little bit like what you, you yeah. write about, is that, you know, why do we worry about some things and not other things? Why do we study some things and not yeah, other things? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, nuclear nuclear weapons, just, I'm, I'm surprised that we don't, aren't talking about it more or worrying about it more. I know. Doing more about it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, Especially now. <laughs> yeah, especially now, yeah. exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, I um, one of our um, traditions at, at um, Grace Cathedral yep. is we take questions. So you have note cards um, that are at your desk, and um, Rebecca um, will um, will will pick some of them up um, for you. Um, 
you know, one of the things that you, you get out of reading your books is just uh, how much you love traveling. Yes. Um, it, or it seems like yes, you do. I, I don't do. know. Maybe I, well, it's just like, I've got to go to... You know. No, I love, I love uh, uh, being able to... It's just being able to like step to through this door. Yeah, yeah. To, uh, well, I mean... Yeah, I, I've done a lot of travel, and I, I do love traveling, but most... Um, it, uh, mostly what I love is being able to just step into this world that I never would, like a nuclear missile submarine. Yeah. I, I just like, well, what's it like down there? Right. You know, what, it, oh, who's, who's do who's on that submarine and what's it like? And what, uh, I, I just am fascinated by, um, any opportunity to spend time with people who live in a, just a different universe by nature of what they know and what they study. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, we're joking a little bit about Fletcherizing, yeah. um, but uh, the, the, one of the things that's interesting about your books, too, is just you know things that we thought we knew and believed in the past, which turned out to be just completely wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, and also just how, uh, how the power of a, of a personality can kind of right. get something to catch on. Fletcherizing was just extreme chewing. Um, Fletcher was, uh, you know, he, there was one instance where he, 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 I think it was for a bite of shallot. It was something like 700 chews. Oh he had this, th he, Fletcher, but the context of, I mean, he wasn't just a chewing nut. He was an efficiency buff. And he, he like, if you look at his papers in, at Harvard, he, he left his papers to Harvard, though he did not go to Harvard, <laughs> which I loved. I did too. Um, so, but he would type, it was thin typing paper, and he typed on both sides all the way out to the margin, so no paper would be wasted. <laughs> it's like, nothing shall be wasted. And he had this belief that if you chew food very, very, very thoroughly, you can exist on 30% less food. And uh -huh. he tried to get, the, he got the military after World War I to kind of um, make this part of the policy. Like, these folks over here, these poor people that we're feeding, you can feed them less if you get them to Fletcherize, just, um, you know, which is... Um, I was Not so glad valid. to hear he was wrong. He would, no, yeah, he was um, it, it just... Um, yeah, but that's interesting because the political effects of all that, too, is just... Yeah. You know, these, these ideas that, that yes. have real consequences. Yeah, very much so. And, and people have, you know, they, the, the, what he didn't, what Fletcher forgot about was the stomach is very good at reducing things yeah. to liquid. That's what the, the stomach does that very well. You right. don't have to do, I mean, there is some, some pre-digestion, some breaking down that happens in the mouth, the saliva kind of breaks things down, uh, but you don't need to do that. Um, and, and you're very boring breakfast partner. You're basically, you're just chewing right. endlessly, monotonously. <laughs> and uh, Franz Kafka was a Fletcherizer. Oh, and there's that's some, funny too. Um, there's some reference in, in one of, uh, the books about him, I think it is about his father complaining about Franz just sits there chewing and <sighs> chewing and chewing. So we, we have a few questions. Okay. Um, the first is just, um, how is DARPA doing on the humans with gills project? Oh yeah, no, well that's, that's dead in the water. That's dead in the water, okay. <laughs> that's good, I like that. You um, can't stop yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, DARPA, you know, when I started this book, I thought I would be spending a lot of time at DARPA. There is kind of no there there with yeah. DARPA. DARPA funds a lot of work. Like they will fund somebody who's studying marine mammals that could sleep unihemispherically. In other words, one part of the brain is still kind of watching for danger and one half is sleeping. And DARPA's like, hey, if we could get our soldiers, what if we cut the brain in half and one half could be, a we wouldn't need to have sentries. You know, yeah. that kind of really outside the box lunatic thinking, yeah. personally. Uh, they will kind of fund it. Uh, it's very futuristic, you know, plus they'll always have the kind of Iron Man suits right, that, right, that you know, when you really get right down to it, the batteries will run out after a couple of hours, and if you fall over, you can't stand up, and <laughs> <laughs> you get shin splints. But, um, but they look really impressive, those exoskeletons. Right, exactly. Um, the, the, so the, gill, the gills thing was just sort of a passing reference. That don't, there, was no, there were no human trials or any... It, wasn't, it, it was mostly th just... Not quite ready a to think, roll out. A yeah. thought experiment, <laughs> yeah. Um, this person wants to know about um, PTSD. If you have, what do you have to say about PTSD? Well, I, I, I didn't actually, uh, there's not a lot of psychology in packing for, uh, sorry, in grunt. Yeah. Uh, so um, that isn't, I didn't actually have a PTSD chapter. Can you, yeah. um, I, 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 you know what I wanted, I was going to, and I wanted to, this isn't help or answer your question, but I wanted to, um, I was going to embed in Afghanistan and go with um, 
the chaplain's corps. I wanted to go out with a chaplain and a chaplain's assistant. Because they go with small units, they go to far forward, they, they are in it and they're taking the same risks. And so I thought that, you know, that they have a unique ability to, uh, for empathy and to, you know, if somebody talks to them about what it's like, they know because they're in that same danger, yeah. a, lo a lot of the same danger. The chaplain doesn't carry a weapon, but the chaplain's assistant covers the chaplain. Right, um, right. And I wanted to do that. And I was turned down because at that time it was the drawdown in Afghanistan and they were only taking um, daily journalists. Yeah, so, yeah. so that was going to be that chapter was going to deal with not necessarily PTSD, but some of like, how do you emotionally support people who are faced with this kind of um, danger and death? Yeah, I mean, I thought about that, about all these books, that you must have all these like files of things that didn't quite make it into any of the chapters, yeah. but you know, which yes. may have been interesting. And, yes, there's uh, always at least five or six or 10. Um, here's a great question that all of us have been asking in our hearts. Can you give us any hints about what you're working on now? <laughs> Um, or is it just top secret? It's yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I, I I'm not really not really talking about it. Yet. Uh, it's a book. Okay. A it's book. a book. It's good. It's nonfiction. Um, not really a, a human body book. So I kind of used up the human body. I mean, I I would have been kind of, you know, hair. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Teeth, skin. I don't know. The brain is too much for me. I don't have a neuroscience background. That's that's too complicated. I think so. Um. Um, some say the body does not lie. What are your thoughts on how our mental spiritual state is reflected um, in our physical biological state? Also so grateful for meeting such wonderful and I can't read the rest. <laughs> but our body, our body's spiritual um, biology. But anyway, so yeah. So, um, yeah, what are the things that the body knows? I'll, I'll read it again. Yeah. Some say the body does not um, lie. Um, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on how our m mental spiritual state is reflected in our physical biological state? Oh, I, I think there's I think there's a lot to that. I think you see someone. I mean, I, I have I have friends who are meditators, Buddhist meditators, and and they don't seem to be aging, as far as I can tell. <laughs> They're, I don't know. They just seem. Um, and, and then you can look at people who you know people who've been through a lot emotionally, spiritually, um, and you, you can kind of see that pain, I think, in their faces and yeah. how they hold themselves. I think that's very true. Well, I think a lot of us have had experience, too, of, of going through very high stress in our life and, and just kind of falling apart physically. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know someone who, uh, a young person who was uh, facing final exams and a um, big section of her hair just oh, yeah. dropped off, came Poor out. Thing. It's come back, which is I'm good. Glad. Yeah. I still feel badly. But um, yeah, no, I, I think there's such a connection. This, there, is yeah. a, this was another question that I had for you too. So I'm on the same page as this person. Footnotes are a fascinating part of your books. How did you start including them? That's that person's <laughs> yes. question. And mine is, yeah, what is your philosophy of footnotes? Like, how do you decide what goes on and go, goes into those footnotes? Well, they're, foot, they're not footnotes in the t typical sense. The, my footnotes are... Uh, me stumbling onto something that really isn't quite germane to what I'm writing about, but it's so fascinating or strange or funny that I have to put it in, I cannot leave it out. It's just me being self-indulgent and me going, I'm gonna put this in, I'm just gonna put it at the bottom of the page. If you don't wanna read it, you don't have to. I can't fit it in without really um, interrupting the flow of the narrative or uh, of the sentences, so I, I put it at the bottom. Uh, and I hope that people discover that uh, th these are not boring footnotes, these are the the best little tidbits. I recently did a reading uh, where I just read 20 footnotes from Bonk. Great. I love that. <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah. I like the footnotes very much. Um, we are increasingly becoming aware of our terrible eating habits due to our very poor, due to the very poor food that's sold to us by the big food industry. What would you recommend to the United States to improve this condition, to reduce obesity and improve um, Western nation health? Um, I, I think uh, that what is it, Michael Pollan's uh, little manifesto? Yeah. Help me here, people. Eat food. Yeah. Not so. Much. Re eat food, real food, not so much. Mostly, mostly plants. plants. Yeah. It's like simple kind of good good advice. I think. Yeah. Real food. 
Yeah. When you first started out, did you have a hard time having people take you seriously on, on this, or the, um, the 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 researchers that I would approach, or, yeah, or yeah. the um, I mean, I read, imagine after readers. Stiff, then things might have been a little easier. Yes, yeah, Stiff was the hardest. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. I and I didn't know how that would go. It could have gone very differently. It could have been, oh, I saw Stiff, and I don't want to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, because you're not going to take me seriously, or I, I don't know. But in fact, the, the further along I've gone, uh, the, the more people are familiar with the books, the easier it has gotten. Yeah. Stiff was difficult. Stiff was hard also because people who work with cadavers, um, who do research that occasionally requires them to work with cadavers, are wary of attention because it's very easy to turn legitimate good work into... Oh my God, they've got a bunch of dead bodies in the freezer and they're just stacked up. I mean, I sometimes hear yeah. from, from television news people going, we've got a story breaking. There are some people who've just got the cadavers right in a freezer and they're in a pile. And I'm like, well, what would you do yeah, with your right. frozen cadavers? Right, right, exactly. I don't know. You can hang them by the, that's, that's done sometimes. Is that better? Yeah, I don't know. You know, no, you don't have a story here. Yeah. Calm down. <laughs> Calm. But cadaver, uh, but, the, but the people who do the work are understandably um, wary of attention. Yeah. So, you know, there, I mean, so there's yeah. those ethical issues around cadavers. There's also like ethical issues around animals too. Yeah. And, oh, uh, yeah. you know, you were at the San Francisco Zoo for a while and yeah. I wonder what that was like. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I, 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 sometimes I dream about just like working yeah. at the zoo and, and taking care of the animals there, but what was it like? Um, well, I worked in, I worked in the public affairs office, uh, which was wonderful and that I was just, a trailer near Gorilla World. And sometimes yeah. people would knock on the door and go, is this Gorilla World? <laughs> not quite. It's like Gorilla like World. Like Gorilla World, not quite. Um, but it, w it, was a f it was a fun job, but I, but I, re I learned very quickly that public, public relations is not, again, not, my, uh, not yeah. a good job for me because I'm, I remember getting a call um, from the press saying we heard a rumor that the, one of the cheetahs was sucked dry by fleas. And instead of addressing that in a mature way or denying or doing damage control, I just, I just started going, wow, how, many f how much blood is in one flea? How much blood is in a cheetah? How many fleas would that take? You know, go, just right, diving down that hole. And my boss is like, what are you doing? <laughs> That's right. Every yeah. flea in North America would have to be sucking yeah, on this cheetah. That poor cheetah. Jeez, <laughs> that poor that's cheetah. a lot of fleas. Yeah. I don't remember which book. Maybe it's Spook when you talk about your mom like reading the Bible to you when you're yes. a child. Yeah. And, 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 and so there's on the one hand there's there's passage that, that passage, and then there's the other passages where you're talking about you know pulling back the curtain on life to be able yes. to see. And then there's that the passage too where you're you're, you're right where you're talking about um, you know the, the northern lights and the inside yes. of your, I, I, like, I, I, I wonder just kind of like how have your like religious views yeah. you know, changed over the course of your life and just it just may not be something yeah. you're not interested in and that's totally well, fine Well I think too, as I mentioned in Spook you know my mom was um, my mom was Catholic and she was she was very uh, um, I mean she wasn't a very spiritual I mean she never spoke about God or anything but she went to church and she followed all the you know she went yeah, and she, she the put rules. the money in the basket yeah. and she went every day and she looked down on the Christmas Catholics who only went on sun, on, on Christmas well, we try so hard not to do that I think that's one thing <laughs> that we're getting better at now <laughs> yeah um, and so she and she, it was a, always a disappointment to her that I didn't embrace Catholicism the way she had. Uh, and I, as I mentioned in, in, in the book, she would read to me, and I was the kind of annoying kid who would be like, Wait a you minute. know, like, all right, the walls of Jericho, they blew the horns, and the walls came down. What if there was, a, there was an earthquake? I mean, this is how, you know, yeah. People draw wrong conclusions all the time. You know, correlation right, is not, not causation. Exactly. And my mom's like, I can't. I hate you. Just <laughs> <laughs> so you know, she finally gave up on me. But I was always, for me, you know, science was was my world of wonder and yeah. and things beyond the scope of my understanding. And so right. I think that just kind of trumped. Ooh, I can't say that word now. I think that kind <laughs> of. It <laughs> uh, is. Um, uh, displaced. Yeah. Um, the or it sense became of, a kind of. It, it became it, a kind it, of piety. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Um, okay. No. Oh gosh, this is kind of hard to read because of the handwriting. <laughs> um, did you ask NASA engineers about their feelings regarding the rise of private space? Oh, what a great question. Oh it, yeah. Um, I I don't remember specific things that. Um, 
I mean, there was, I think there's a sense of, um, uh, there's, less, there's less of a, competi a competition than you would think because, I mean, they've always been integrated. NASA has always had dozens of contractors making, uh, making the rockets, making the launch pad, making, I mean, they, they, they are kind of the policy body right. and they train the astronauts and the astronauts are part of NASA, but all of the components and the rockets and the pieces and the, even the suits, that's all outside, that's private. Yeah. So it's always been a, a, a collaboration. So, yeah. it, so it, when, when you're inside that world, it seems like less of a um, that's disconnect. So, that's, that's very helpful. Because, yeah. I, I mean, um, I can totally imagine that. Lockheed does the jet... jet uh, yeah, yes. The, you would right. describe the Boeing company that made and the yeah, right. suits. And, and the suits. Yeah. And, um, and even now, uh, SpaceX uh, with a uh, crew capsule. Oh, yeah, it, right, yeah, right, right. So, yeah, it's funny because the people who I talk to are in that interest, talk as if they're part of NASA, even though they're getting a paycheck from Lockheed. They, right. You know, they, it is more integrated than It you. is very much so. And when you're a contractor, you, I mean, some of the contractors I spoke to um, were very careful about what they said because they don't want to lose, you know, they don't want to say something that would alienate NASA and cause them to lose their um, contract right, or exactly. sever that connection. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite footnote or two? Oh. How did you? I, I could just open up Bonk anywhere. <laughs> Here you go. Oh, yeah, let me bonk see. Bonk has, bonk has twice as twice as, as many footnotes, many footnotes <laughs> I think, as. Um, let and me this, see. So, so the next. Um, what about the liver? So the oh. liver. No, I don't. Is the liver in Bonk? No, it's okay, in, uh, here's it's one. in gulp. All right, Liver's you want me to gulp. read? I'll read one footnote. Yeah, let's read okay. one footnote. All right, it's a little bit long. Okay, this has to do with um, um, the this is a discussion about um, erectile dysfunction and drugs and treatments. <laughs> Which I, you know, Grace Cathedral, don't you always have to work erectile dysfunction? We, oh, completely. And you know. It's the today's sermon is about that. <laughs> 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 Uh, all right, this is about um, a sex researcher, a British researcher, Giles, Giles Brindley. Um, and he was involved in something else, but he discovered, uh, anyway, okay. Um, at a 19, this is about him. At a 1983 urology conference, Brindley delivered a lecture about a new impotency drug, papaverine, that produced robust erections when injected directly into the penis. Oh, yeah, I, I just opened to this page, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't put stars in the, in the side. In the <laughs> no. He began by showing his audience, a group of around 80 urologists and their wives, many en route to the conference cocktail party and dressed in formal attire, <laughs> a series of slides of his own penis after various dosages. He then revealed that five minutes earlier, he had injected himself oh. <laughs> with papaverine. He pulled the fabric of his tracksuit tightly against his hips to reveal the outline of his medicated member. <laughs> Not satisfied, he then pulled down his pants, revealing, in the words of eyewitness Lawrence Klotz, quote, a long, thin, clearly erect penis. <laughs> Klotz's account of the event was published in British Journal of Urology in 2005. This is further Klotz, quote, Brindley paused, seeming to ponder his next move. The sense of drama in the room was palpable. <laughs> <laughs> he then said with gravity, I'd like to give some of the audience the opportunity to confirm the degree of tumescence. <laughs> With his pants at his knees, he waddled down the stairs as he approached the audience, erection waggling before him. Four or five of the women in the front rows threw their arms in the air and screamed. <laughs> the scream seemed to shock Professor Brindley, who rapidly pulled up his trousers and terminated the lecture. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That yeah. does give you a sense for it right there. Yeah, yeah, it does. It just, yes. Poor, poor Dr. Brindley. So I, I have to um, go up and preach my sermon about um, erectile dysfunction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I wonder if you, you can just um, give us a sense for just things that you might want us to remember from your work, or, and also maybe some, some sense, too, just about um, just signs of hope that you see in the, in the future. Oh, I'm always, um, uh, all of these books, um, the, the people that I've met, and in, including, including Grunt, well, you know, I'm not, a, um, I'm not a big fan of war, but I really have in, so much admiration for the men and women who, not just who, who serve and are in combat, but the men and women who try to make that less painful, less risky, yeah. safer, um, they're kind of the unsung heroes, and I think all, all of 
most of the people that I speak to in these books really are kind of unsung heroes. They are um, you, just quietly working away, trying to understand how bodies work, make them w work better, make people under understand themselves a little bit more. So I'm always inspired by scientists yeah. and, and by science, even though I don't have a degree myself. Yeah, yeah that's great. And, and, and you're right. I mean, the headlines are about so many awful things. Um, but um, yeah. there are a lot of people just doing their ordinary work day to day yeah. Um, yeah. Who, who are doing it to, just to make life a little bit better for the people yeah, around Yeah, in ge just in general, human beings are inspiring and kind. All you have to do is travel somewhere in the world, and uh, I don't care where you are, all you have to do is say, can you help me? Right. And so people are so happy to help. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's hard to focus on that with all the hate that's flying around in the air and in the news and in social media, but people are basically good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In a way, that's what you did. You were the person yeah. who said, can you help me to a lot of very interesting to, yes, people. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then you yes. presented them in a yep. beautiful light. We're, yeah. we're so grateful to, to, for your work, Mary, and we're yeah. looking forward to the next secret thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you <laughs> and, so much. Um, it's been yeah. such a pleasure to have you here. Um, next week, we're going to be having Earl Smith, who's a chaplain from um, San Quentin Prisoner, Prison, mm -hmm. and he was also um, the chaplain for the, the, um, the San Francisco War, War, the Golden State Warriors, and oh, for the wow. San Francisco 49ers. He, he's um, someone who I um, know uh, um, and a very interesting person, very dedicated in his own, in his own world. Um, we will be having the 11 o'clock service right after this. Um, Mary will be um, signing books um, there. Um, when you're done, yep. you can just come up and check out the cathedral. Okay. Um, and then we also um, take donations just because you know everything at the cathedral is um, expensive. Um, there's a little credit card machine and a little box for, for cash. Um, so thank you again for Mary yeah. Roach for being with us um, today. We're, we're so grateful for your work and we look forward to seeing the next thing. Thank you, Malcolm. Thanks. <laughs> thank you.